Welcome to, to the next FOSS North podcast episode. Uh, today we have Lukas from uh, Pine64 with us. Welcome. So yeah, Hi, thanks so for having tell me. Us something about you. <laughs> something about me. Um, I have been a part of the Linux community on and off since 2005. I had my first encounter with Linux during university years. Um, but it wasn't really until the whole Raspberry Pi thing happened um, that I had been reacquainted with, with Linux on a daily basis. And soon after that, uh, in 2015, the Pine64 Kickstarter campaign started. I was then, at that point in time, I was writing a PhD and I was looking for devices uh, which would kind of suit my particular use case. And the Pine Inc. 64, which was then on Kickstarter, was something I was interested in. So I was one of the original backers. And then I kind of got actively engaged in the community and then joined the team uh, soon after, in 2016. The, I had a meeting then in London with, uh, with the founder of Pine 64, with TLM. We had a good chat, and he said that I could be uh, that I could kind of do the community side of things that he thinks that this is something that I would be good at. And I said, sure, I'm very keen on giving that a go, although it's outside of my area of competency. And that's how my story with Pine64 began. And, cool. Uh, so so you, you started with the embedded boards then, uh, because now you do a lot more. <laughs> Yes. So at the time when I was entering, you know, uh, this uh, the Linux ecosystem, I was still very much a kind of my daily system was Mac, um, and uh, you know I have been running Linux for five years now on a on a daily basis. But uh, as I said prior to this, I have been a part of the open source community, perhaps even more than the Linux community because I've been using um, open and, uh, and free software prior to this, but uh, Linux was an on and off story prior to prior to 2015 for me. But then for for the Pine 6, I mean, historically, it started off as something similar to Raspberry Pi, right? Like a, a similar board type thing, no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the first Kickstarter was for a single board computer type device. Uh, single board computers are still, in a sense, our bread and butter, although it's late. The things that people are, from a media perspective as well, community perspective, the things that tend to bring us the most traffic and interest are our devices, not to single board computers, but um, single board computers are where we kind of started and this is where we were doing new single board computers and we're kind of investing time and research and development into, into that uh, continually. But yes, it did start with the single board computer. Uh, the vision behind it was quite different to Raspberry Pi, however, because Raspberry Pi is aimed at education, primarily, obviously, people use it mm. for all sorts of stuff. But the kind of initiative behind it was to uh, for educational purposes. Well, Pine64, Pine A64, which is the first board, was kind of aimed at developers specifically, and the goal was to bring uh, Linux to then 64-bit um, ARM architecture, because that was the first 64-bit uh, ARM board, while they available at, at, at that sort of price point. I still have my two uh, boards, by the way. I, uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I joined you early on. I don't use them today, but perhaps I should start using them again. But then you, in, I mean, I discovered you through the Pinebook Pro. And I, uh -huh. And then, then I realized that through my KDE connections, I've seen the Pine book for years. Uh, and it, it mm. turns out that everyone I know has one. Uh, but you have the tablet too. And then the, the latest edition, which I should have had with me in Shono Cam, of course, would have been the cam, the, the phone. Uh, that mm. sits on the charger out in the kitchen, unfortunately. Uh, ah, the phone. Wh which OS do you run? Uh, this is uh, Manjaro with uh, KDE Plasma Mobile. Cool. Yeah, I I have the, the standard Plasma install as well at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an interesting little machine actually. But it, 
all these, from my understanding, share basically the same design. I mean, it's the embedded board that you sell that is then sort of repackaged into these different packages, or how different are they hardware-wise? So uh, we have a sort of a, a crawl, walk, run mentality. So we start with introducing a board with a uh, with a SOC. This SOC is usually not uh, supported in mainline, or it's never supported in mainline at that time. So that's the crawl stage, and we we create a single board computer which we target at developers at this stage. And we have this entire bring up process right now. Our newest board is the Quartz sixty four, and again, it is at a stage where nothing runs on it at, at present time, and we're going to be rolling it out to developers. And then when mainline Linux runs on that, we proceed on to exploring kind of what sort of application, what sort of devices would this be suitable for and compatible with uh, in, in relation to the original single board computer. So as a basis for development. Um, and then that's the walk stage where we transition from you know something that the SOC supports, uh, you know all the basic Linux stuff, and it can run a, a user interface and all that. But then a lot of patches are still needed to make something like a phone run because it has so many other things that you know this single board computer doesn't have the the display, uh, all the different sensors, all that sort of stuff that is usually not in mainline Linux, you know? So that's the walk stage. So that gets patched, uh, the entire bring up process of a phone or some other device uh, uh, takes place. And then uh, this is where we get usually advanced users involved and contributing to uh, developers from partner projects as well as uh, community developers. And then there's obviously the run phase, which is when we feel that a product is end user ready and then we kind of, we we then start targeting it as a end user product. Yeah, we we advertise it as such. Where, where would you say that your products are at the moment? I mean, the Pinebook Pro feels like an end user product at the moment, uh, but you have a, a number of things brewing, so to speak. I've, I've been eyeing this little camera thing, for instance, which I guess in the is in the crawl stage. Crawl stage, yes, very much. Um, actually, it it is slowly transitioning into the walk stage. Uh, um, it, it has been brought up quite quickly. Uh, right now, you can get mainline uh, Debian uh, Linux Armbian specifically running on it and a number of other operating systems. Um, the problem is, as I understand, is uh, audio uh, decoding. Um, and getting that working properly with the camera, which obviously, in a sense, defeats the purpose of, of, of the camera. Uh, but uh, so apart on the open source IP camera, uh, the only thing that does not work properly is the camera bit. But <laughs> apart, from that, apart from that, it is perfectly functional. Um, so yes, so it is transitioning into the walk stage when somebody will eventually get you know that bit working and then it will enter the walk phase when we want to invite uh, sort of higher tier developers who will develop the user interfaces to make it work as a security cam on it or a nanny cam or whatnot. I'm curious here. The uh, between these stages, like crawl, walk, etc. The how do you interact with like the software communities such as KDE? So we uh, we usually bring on developers quite early. Uh, we bring developers usually on long before a single board computer is even developed. Uh, so we kind of approach them and we say, so what would you like to see in a device such as this? Um, um, we So we work with the community. And when I say community, I, need, I mean both um, developers as well as end users at different stages throughout the process. So the, we contact developers first, obviously the most trusted developers, for instance, when it comes to the phone, we obviously talk to those who have extensive expertise in mobile and say, you know, 
what sort of solutions would you like us to implement and, and have a shot at? Is there anything interesting uh, that, you, that you like to see us do here? Uh, you know, things such as the pogo pins, for instance, being one of the very early feedback from people uh, in the know who, who really knew the mobile space um, uh, before we entered it, yeah? So, uh, so we interact with developers, they give us feedback. We, we, we go to the engineers, we say, you know, this is the sort of stuff we would want. They create some prototypes, we send them to, uh, to developers. Um, and then when we get, it, get this back, we engage a wider audience of developers. And usually these are, would be our partner projects. So that would be KDE. We show them the device. We say, what do you guys make of it? And then we get feedback from them. And then after this point, when they give us feedback and we implement whatever feedback they have, then we announce the project. We say what the project will be like. Uh, and then we ask the community, here are kind of, you know, the things which we're going to be doing. Is there something else you would like to see implemented at this stage? So the reason why we engage end users at a, at a sort of a third phase of the community engagement is because we learned that if you engage a large number of people very early on, they will be request. There will be first of all a, a lot of different requests, many of them conflicting. Um, and second of all, people have a tendency to ask for the highest end possible stuff, regardless of whether that makes any sense. If we have the technical expertise to manufacture it, and if we can manufacture it, if it makes any sense, yeah. Because obviously we could create the, you know, a super high end Qualcomm phone, yeah. But like nobody would ever get mainline Linux working perfectly on it. It will cost a fortune. It probably wouldn't be particularly good because we don't have at, at the point at the time when we were making the Pine phone, we didn't have the sort of expertise to create a very advanced phone. So. Um, uh, the the sort of third part reach out to to the community is is such as uh, you know have do you think that we have missed anything and uh, so there's the three stage. Uh, I'm curious. Hey, so you you mentioned you ship prototypes. Uh, is that hardware prototypes? Yes. Who pays for them? Well, we sh we don't make our partner projects pay for prototypes. We we provide them free of charge. Mm. Um, uh, we don't, as, as a principle, with projects which we have an established relationship with, we, we take to provide them the hardware uh, free of charge. We, from a funding perspective, there's the Pine Store, which is the business side of Pine64. And the sole purpose of the Pine Store is to uh, create things for the community. So there is, so it is. It's not meant to generate profit per se. It's meant to generate enough revenue so that new fun things can be created. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And also, so there's surplus of money, so we can give out prototypes and what have you. Excellent. It's quite fun, and that leads me into the why, because it's it's kind of fun when, when when looking at your laptops, for instance, that the goal is to provide the hardware to to developers. You you state that clearly. Um, I mean, what, what what's the end goal? Is it just to to improve Linux adoption or the quality of the Linux mainline, or what's what sort of your vision that you're driving towards? Yeah. So I mean. For sure, there's a. Um, I think there's multiple things. Uh, first of all, Linux only hardware tends to be really expensive, um, for for reasons which are perfectly understandable. If you are a boutique manufacturer of x86 laptops, it's an expensive process, and I, you know, so uh, it's fully understandable that these devices cost a lot. Yeah. But uh, having ARM as a basis and having a fairly unique set of contacts in, in Asia, we knew early on that we can provide uh, relatively inexpensive and good quality uh, devices for the sake of people who want to run Linux, that they can obtain good quality 
hardware which they can run Linux on, which Linux was designed for, in a sense. Uh, but also to make, uh, to popularize ARM, six, uh, ARM and ARM 64, 64-bit ARM specifically as a, um, as a platform which can be used in, uh, in, uh, in desktop computing. I mean, it may, may be quite obvious to us today, but when we were doing it initially in 2016 and 17, this wasn't completely common common sense, yeah. Um, but there's definitely also just a sense of, let's see what we can do. What sort of fun things can we do within this space? Uh, such as the, you know, IP camera. Yeah, there's obviously a very strong uh, privacy component, which, you know, say, I, as a parent, I understand. I don't want a random camera pointed at my child uh where you know i have to download some sort of application from which i have no control over which connects to to the internet um i'd rather have a cam which i can you know interface with via vpn a private vpn on the, or or and i know the software that's running on it um so there's there's definitely a sort of an aspect where we 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 take an ideological stance and we think okay there, there's definitely an audience for this who who will appreciate it, but then there's also things which we just do because we want to explore things on our own. And and the soldering iron running, you know, risk risk five is one of these things. It's just done for free. It's 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 uh, it was just an experiment on our part, and a soldering iron was a fun thing to 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 create. Cool. And there you actually touched on, on one more thing. You're, we're making these perfect segues now. So. <laughs> Risk five. I, I I saw it fly by in the, in, in these monthly updates. Uh, so, so on your site, you have these great community updates going through all the projects and uh, and everything. And then there I saw Risk five fly by. Well, I mean, are are you targeting that now? I mean, that's even more open source than. Or potentially more open source than than being based on ARM, or what's the general direction, or is it just a sidetrack? Yeah, I mean, at this point, we just want to have a go at it and sort of see what it is for ourselves. To so we have a good relationship with uh, this particular uh, silicon vendor. They are creating an entry level uh, Risk Five um, SOC. Um, we we aren't really at the stage where we want to create a very advanced uh, risk 5 single board computer or, or 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 system or device we want to make a very accessible risk 5 device which everybody can pick up uh, we want to make it as affordable as possible so the, the target price being around the $15 uh, dollar, uh, price point, but we obviously going to stri strive to make it even less than that, if possible. Um, the idea is to get Risk Five devices into people's hands and see what they make of the architecture of the platform. Yeah? Um, we definitely want to explore it, but we, you know, again, we we tend to be rather cautious as a project. We uh, we we start small with simple SOCs, uh, see how the market develops, see how end users' uh, interests develop over time, and uh, you know this may be our first and only venture, or maybe one of uh, you know one of first ventures in a long series of things which we're gonna do risk with Risk Five. I mean, it's likely the latter. Uh, we right, likely will be exploring Risk Five uh, more in the coming years, um, but uh, you, you know, but we we don't know at this point. Cool. We spoke to to Olaf Schindgren, uh, who's been involved in Risk Five like a month ago or something, and and one of the things he mentioned was that the groundwork laid by porting everything so that it's available on ARM will actually help benefit Risk Five because sort of then the if statements are in all the make files and everything. So, so you just extend it with one more case. Um, do you have a, I, being a non-engineer, I realize I ask you a technical question, is, but what, what's your experience compared to, to sort of bringing up ARM when that wasn't mature or ARM64 and, and now going towards uh, RISC-V? 
so yeah, so this is a, a, a question which I will not be answered to, uh, a question which I won't be able to answer because my knowledge of sort of low level software is effectively close to zero. Uh, what I will tell you is that I have, what I can do is I could tell you, um, I've spoken to developers who have some experience with RISC-V and extensive experience with ARM. And as my understanding is that if you have an understanding of ARM, then going into uh, RISC-V, which is also, you know, for the most part, an em embedded architecture, uh, you clearly have a significant advantage uh, in understanding how, how things function. Um, also, the documentation uh, on, on RISC-V tends to be such that when coming in, uh, you have a m major advantage over ARM64 platforms. I, I have to ask as well re regarding your uh, the RISC-V silicon that you're running. Is it an open source design or, or is it one of the... It's an open source design. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So it's an open source design and um, the uh, Wi-Fi and uh, BLE module, which we will be using on this uh, single board computer, is also going to be a RISC-V based uh, uh, module. So, uh, and that has already been brought up, and uh, that was not originally a um, an open design. However, we have had a relatively good uh, relationship with the with the vendor. And it has become more and more open. And then uh, we created a, um, a scheme where people interested in picking up one of those units, they could uh, go into the Pine store and pick one up for free uh, for a period of time. I can't remember what it was, but we made it completely free of charge for like two weeks or something. Just so like a lot of people would get hold of them. Um, and and start open sourcing it, and I I believe it has been open sourced uh, as far as Wi-Fi and BLE can be open sourced, so quite extensively at this point. Yeah, I seem to recall reading that the uh, the modem in your phone runs Linux now, so so you actually have two Linux systems in the Linux phone, which is good fun. Yes, <laughs> it's it's yeah. So uh, and f fun fact is that. Not only does it run Linux, it also the uh, community built Linux operating system for the modem uh, functions better than the proprietary uh, firmware that came with the modem, which is which is quite extraordinary uh, to me. So obviously there are parts of the of the modem which cannot be uh, open sourced also for for legal purposes, and we will not be shipping. Uh, well, we will be shipping the modem unaltered, uh, just not to run into problems. But it is absolutely possible now to flash uh, Linux to 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 the modem and and have Linux running on, on the modem. Um, so, and there's even attempts at having completely mainline Linux running on the modem, which are already so they're in very much the crawl stages. Uh, but but it's coming along. It's already running. So they got like something like po post market OS and Arch running on the modem so cool <laughs> but the, the you said that you're shipping it unaltered is is the concern then sort of the legality like radio radio frequency spectrums or, or does gpl and blobs cause distribution problems as well both um so uh, to us the main concern is legality we don't want to uh you know mm, it's the it's the one thing which we don't really want to mess with. Uh, so there are parts of the modem which cannot be open source for legal reasons. Um, now, as as I understand it, this community firm uh, uh, firmware for for the modem does not uh, actually violate any any of the legal aspects. It maintains whatever these things that have to be closed are closed and are not tampered with in in any ways. But seeing as we cannot have a complete assurance that it will function properly and that none of the things that cannot... Uh, so end users should not be allowed to change various things uh, related to, to how the modem identifies you on the network. 
uh, as I understand it, with Linux, it is very trivial to do some of these things. Now, we won't be doing it, and if we were, were to ship it with, with this custom um, uh, firmware made by the community, obviously it would be technically fine, but we don't want to run into problems in some area of the world where regulation is such that you know they could postulate that we have made it easy for for end uh, users to alter um, you know some of the things which are meant to be un, uh, unchangeable. Yeah, makes sense. So I, I want to dive into high-end pine books, but I'm not sure if anyone else has questions <laughs> before we switch topic again. You're muted, Henrik. Otherwise, it, it sounds like you're wondering something. Can we keep that so my friends can laugh at me, my colleagues? Uh, of course, of course. Yeah, good. <laughs> you know who I'm talking to. Uh, so no, I think uh, all my questions have been answered so far. So I'm, I'm fine. So yeah, I'm, I'm running the Pinebook Pro as, I wouldn't say daily driver. It's more of a nightly driver because there are no mm -hmm. fans and nothing to disturb the rest of the family. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. I tend to hack from bed, uh, mm -hmm. which is good. And I can also use my phone charger for it. So it fits that use case perfectly. And I can also tell you that the keyboard makes a less annoying sound than the XPS 13, my wife tells me. <laughs> so, so that's a good use that case. That is good, yeah. Uh, I, but I'm just wondering, are you planning to sort of move out of the, the Chromebook uh, price range, G given Apple's move into high-end arms and, and so on? Are you, are you looking well, into that space as well? I mean, uh, Apple's move is, by and large, completely irrelevant to, to, to us, what they do. I mean, it really has no impact either way. Uh, but yeah, of course. I mean, f for sure. The, the Pinebook Pro has proven that you can make a quite capable uh, entry-level Linux laptop with some interesting features, and that if you want to do light light workload on it and browse the internet and do some writing and do some terminal work then it is a very suitable tool that can be delivered to people at a reasonable price point and uh, of course we're looking into uh, you know into other uh, into the future of of uh, of of laptops uh, on on the arm platform as well um mm. There, there are a couple of candidate SOCs, but again, uh, first a single board computer, then a laptop. I mean, uh, it's we everyone knows that Rockchip is coming out with a very, very interesting and capable SOC, which many people have speculated will find its way into the next Pinebook Pro. Uh, sure, uh, that is highly likely that it will. Uh, but before it does, it needs to run Linux. Yeah. And, uh, when it comes out, whenever it comes out, we, we actually don't know. I mean, uh, the situation in China, uh, right now in terms of production is highly dire. It's very difficult. So whenever Rockchip are, are capable of delivering that SOC, we'll definitely pick it up and take a look at it, but it's going to be a while before it is at a stage where we can put it inside of any actual device. Mm. You, you I was did. also thinking like uh, like like something along the lines of what Johan was saying that uh, it would be nice to have something sort of in between the range of the current uh, Pinebook Pro and I guess what for example Purism is offering uh, which is more like a uh, I don't know regular regular work laptop but uh, but completely free I would, something like in between power wise would have been at least for me as a developer, it would be like uh, satisfying in the way that I could do slightly more than, I mean, than the single board computer type power, but still, uh, like buying a f for my for my spare time, I don't want to spend that much money, for example, for a mm -hmm. for a Purism laptop, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think that the next generation of uh, SOCs, which are designated as those which Rockchip will actively mainline themselves. So these are the ones which we're interested in, obviously. Um, uh, 
they look very, very interesting. And on paper, I imagine that they are on par with uh, mobile Ryzen 3 uh, CPUs. So that's real power already at that point. Uh, obviously, it's not, you know, it's it's not on par with, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, one particular company, but there are others that also, uh, you know, uh, create uh, laptops, boutique laptops in this sphere. Uh, obviously, it will not be on par with that, but it will be more capable than your uh, average uh, Chromebook, yeah? Running an entry-level uh, Intel chip. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm thinking about the like the uh, my own private evangelism sphere of uh, sp spreading uh, this type of both both Linux as an operating system, but also like uh, hardware in terms of uh, so something something different. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, that would make it uh, that would make it more accessible for the the everyday person who may not do anything with higher workloads anyway, but uh, you know. They will maybe watch YouTube in high definition or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, packaging wise, I, I find it quite attractive because I guess it's the arm that makes it possible because the the lower power consumption. Because I my work daily driver is a Dell XPS, which I guess is in like the two thousand euro range. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's. it's it's nicer in some aspects. It's a 4K screen and, and all of that, but you have to pay a lot more for it. Uh, but packaging-wise, I'd, I'd say that the Pinebook Pro is sort of the same to me. It's lightweight, it's fairly sturdy, and so on. And, and of course, it's slightly different materials given the price point. But if you go in between there, you generally end up with quite clunky laptops, in, in my experience, <laughs> because then you're talking consumer-grade plastic four centimeters thick. Uh, right, it's a type of laptop my father would buy. Yeah. So, he so, knows so nothing about the, computers. There is a space in between, hint, hint, <laughs> nudge, nudge. But <laughs> yeah, I like mean, you already know it. I, I, I think we could build a kick-ass laptop for $400. I really do. Um, and I, mean, you could uh, sell it. and I, I do think we could sell it. But again, it's not a question of if we can do it. In fact, we are pretty confident that we can uh, make a really, really good uh, next Pinebook Pro. Uh, it's just a question of, you know, getting Rockchip to release that particular SOC or, or, you know, one of the other silicon vendors who we work with to release something that is comparable, um, evaluate it and have, um, have uh, developers bring uh, Linux to it, yeah? So, Right now, with our next board, with the Quartz 64, uh, we kind of told people that when looking at the next generation of, of phones, that we do think that we probably will be using that particular rock chip in the next generation of, of our phones. Uh, and I do think that this also entices developers to pick up one of those boards and, and contribute to, to bringing it up because they know that the sooner this thing runs on this board, the sooner we can move into the the, the walk stage yeah, and start uh, exploring um, the possibilities. So yes, definitely there's this is not our last laptop, yeah, for sure. Cool. The, the, the only problem for me is that you will break one of my use cases. So, so on the side, I, I, I do a, a web app uh, with a Django backend. And I tried to run it at least a couple of weeks on the Pinebook Pro with the web server also running on the web on the Pinebook Pro because you sort out a lot of the slow internet connection, slow renderer issues, which is actually mm -hmm. quite healthy and hard to simulate otherwise. I mean, you you have to fit your designs to to sort of a non-developer machine, um, and it really helps in doing that. And it's still powerful enough to run like a decent size web app and then a browser on top of it and all of it so which operating system are you oh yeah you told me you you're, yeah you're i'm on the manjaro still uh because i'm i'm uh i'm afraid of doing the distro hopping to to an unofficial debian otherwise i'm uh i know my apt get lines and i always have to to go to dr go for for my pacman 
command line. So <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I I th I think there is actually official Debian and an official Debian installer. I just don't think that it contains everything uh, to make the the Pinebook Pro run perfectly. Um, so um, I think that the unofficial uh, Debian installer is effectively uh, the official installer plus all the bits, which are all the patches to mainline, which make the, the Pinebook Pro fully functional. Yeah. From, from what I understand, the the next version of Debian will target the Pinebook officially so, so that it's a part of the installers. I think there are alpha installers now that you can get from upstream Debian, so to speak. I see. Yeah. Then, you, then you may know more than more than I do. Uh, on well, this well I, I, I read your newsletter, so <laughs> it's oh, I see. Okay. Through Pine sixty four somehow. Uh, but I mean, it, I think it comes with age. So back in the nineties, I would easily have distro hopped three, four times a, a year. But now it's just a pain. I mean, I use it. <laughs> I can get my email. Why? Why should I bother? <laughs> The yeah. logo is green, but I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, well, to to everyone who, who who's watching this and, and to yourself, uh, are, the guys from Armbian have just released their uh, Ubuntu build uh, with GNOME uh, desktop, which is fully accelerated using the open source uh, GPU driver. And I've given it a spin just just the other day, and it is absolutely mind-blowingly excellent. So, if uh, I I know KDE is your thing, so uh, but, but, <laughs> but the other two looks happy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but for those who who do like uh, GNOME, then uh, it now runs really, 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 really well on, on the Pinebook Pro. Oh, really well, cool. very very nice experience. And I need a new laptop. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> No, but it, it's kind of impressive because I think was it Blender who has a Pinebook Pro specific build? Uh, but because the, the the GL stack looks a bit strange from a desktop perspective because it, it uses the the OpenGL ES um, profiles, which are more common in embedded. So sometimes that's sort of the build trick you need to do. And then Blender runs quite nicely, at least in the in the basic modes. Uh, on the Pinebook Pro, which is highly so, impressive. So the so the open source driver uh, supports regular uh, OpenGL. Ah, then you can go full. Yep. So it's the the uh, the proprietary Mali driver that has a particular limitation because obviously it was developed primarily with uh, with mobile and tablet um, uh, in mind, while the open source driver can run full-blown OpenGL. And I think that even they have, they've moved into an alpha integration of uh, OpenGL 3.0, even at this stage, so. Then I need to poke more at Pac-Man and see how I can convince it to, <laughs> <laughs> to pull in the great driver's stack. Yes, I think Mesa Git is a, is a thing that you need to pull. Ah, and, uh, yeah. Cool. So Thank there you, there you go. That's my evening ruined. <laughs> <laughs> But in, in general, the, you have another thing that, that I'm really interested in. So, so I actually have an old N900 lying around here, uh, mm. which I used for far too long because it has a physical keyboard. And you mentioned yes. Pogo Stick earlier. Do, do yes. you have any any sort of timeline updates on, on the keyboard for the Pine Phone? Um, for, for the keyboard specifically, yes. So we... Um, we just got the keycaps back from the factory, uh, which means that the, the only bit that's missing is the actual logic board uh, for, for, for the keyboard. Um, that should be in this month. Um, you know what? It could be as early as April or uh, as late as June. It kind of depends on the manufacturing situation. Uh, which is simply not easy right now. It's a, it's it's a very very difficult and complex situation in China right now when it comes to manufacturers. So it could be next month. It could be in uh, in two months time. Uh, we're gonna obviously be striving to uh, to have it out 
uh, as soon as possible. We know that a lot of people are waiting for it and think that it's going to be fun to have a, a pocketable PDA with uh, with modem capabilities. Yeah, I mean, the, the, one, of, one of the first things I tried on uh, when I got it booted was to just run an X session over SSH, which is always good fun to, to run X clock remotely. But having that capability and a physical keyboard, I mean, then then you're back to the N900 and then you can do cool, yeah. funky stuff on your phone. And all I heard yeah. from you was, I didn't hear the delay. I heard you'd have it by the, your summer vacation. So you can play with it. <laughs> so, so they, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and it obviously opens up a um, um, some other fun and not necessarily sensible possibilities, which is you know, why not install a Mate desktop uh, alongside you know whatever else you have, or uh, why not install install full uh, GNOME, or you know, somebody is already porting XFCE to. to to it, so I'm not saying it is in my mind. It not it's not necessarily sensible, but if you if you want to, then perfectly doable. Um, uh, and with a keyboard, you know, maybe it is uh, for someone who who needs just a terminal or what have you. You know, it may be perfectly reasonable to have a full desktop uh, on on a phone. I mean, who am I to judge? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't always have to be sensible. Sometimes it's enough that it's just fun. Absolutely. I mean, it's the perfect Fostam laptop. You just pocket it and bring it and hack. <laughs> yes. So, uh, yeah, we, uh, we're we quite pleased with uh, how it turned out. We have been thinking about how to make the, uh, the keyboard for, for a very, very long time. And we were going back and forth between... Uh, designs that we wanted. Uh, so there was the slide out design, which we were thinking about, something which we want to revisit again in the future. Um, but because we have nobody has access to go to, to China right now. Um, so we can't take a flight and, uh, you know, so we need to rely on uh, secondhand sources on whether you know this vendor is capable of producing X or producing Y, uh, so we we took a chance on a relatively simple design mechanically. A clamshell design is relatively simple. Yeah. Uh, a, a slide out design would entail quite a bit of engineering in the in the hinge and in that mechanism. So uh, this may be one of two or three keyboards for for the Pine Phone. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, I'm super, super thrilled with uh, how this one has is shaping up. Yeah, and as soon as you have the pogo sticks, you have the ability to to really expand in any direction. Yes. Yep. So I square C, which can which can and will be used definitely for not only the keyboard but also um, a fingerprint reader which has uh, was started by one of the community members. And then I saw it, I was like, that's pretty cool. Um, and I reached out to him and we have been working with him to bring that um, uh, to the to the store. Um, and uh, I'm told that people are developing all sorts of, so people have gotten hacked a um, IR camera into the phone. Um, as well as a bunch of other sensors, and we are thinking about bringing Laura to um, as a as a back cover to 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 the Pine Phone. So there's a lot of fun to be had with uh, with with Pogo pins and I squared C. Are your are like the mechanical designs of the phone back cover available as well, like STL STLs? Yeah. yeah. So it's a 3D printer and soldering iron and, and hacker weight. Very much so. So anyone with a 3D printer can make their own back cover and modify it to, to fit what, whatever you know experiment people are working on. So yeah. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I was... Uh, um, with the original Pine Book when we made that, so that's the original Pine Book in 2016, 17. Uh, we have hope that people will pick it up 
and to because it was uh, eighty nine dollars when we released it. So we 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 hope that people are gonna pick it up and um, kind of just hack weird weird functionality into it and kind of just play with it and use it to you know uh, to show kids what sort of fun you can have with 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 this sort of hardware which you can open and how easily you can change things and and add functionality uh, to it but this never materialized and uh i think that people wanted it to be a full blown uh linux uh, arm laptop and therefore you know the pinebook pro eventually is just very much a Linux laptop. Uh, it, it's it, it. A lot of the headers are not even you know exposed uh, on 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 the PCB because we didn't see uh, any interest in it. But with the with the phone, there seems to be a dedicated group within the community who want to do crazy stuff with it. Yeah, uh, which is very very interesting to me uh, that. Uh, with 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 the phone, we definitely didn't have this. Uh, you know, having uh, people tinker hardware wise wasn't really on uh, our at the top of our list of why we're adding pogo pins. Pogo pins were added for the keyboard, for for you know all sorts of accessories and stuff. Uh, but uh, surprisingly, many people have hacked all sorts of weird functionality into the device. That's cool. And I mean, that, that's one of the benefits then of, of building this as a community project and, and really like enabling people to do these things mm. to, to bring out the craziness. Cool. I, I think we're slowly running out of time. So, so I was wondering if uh, do you have anything more that you want to share or shall we start wrapping up? I don't know if I have anything particular that I want to share. We have a lot of fun things. Uh, in the pipeline and for those people who keep on asking when is x and when is y going to be back in stock the answer is very soon hopefully uh, we're being we're being more cautious than usual with opening pre-orders because of how difficult the manufacturing situation is so we will open pre-orders only when the factory has started the manufacturing process at this point in time uh, because we don't want to take people's money and then have the factory tell us last moment oh we can't get component x or component y uh, and you know you have to wait for a month two months three months four months whenever uh, uh, and then we're stuck with you know with, with holding on to people's money is something which we don't want to do so uh, so for those people asking that and you can always find uh, information about what's coming and uh, what's happening on our website. Yeah, and we'll, we'll collect some uh, some links for this episode as well. Uh, so I'll, we'll make sure that everyone has a good link list. Um, good but then I'd like to thank you. It, it's been fun. Thank you for joining. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And, and I also want to mention that we just opened the call for papers, or, or when this goes live, maybe we opened the call for papers three, four weeks ago <laughs> for the for the FOSS North event, which will be end of May, uh, beginning of June this year. Uh, let's see if we can meet physically and finally have a conference, or, or if it'll be another virtual event. Uh, but something will definitely happen. So. If you have crazy pine phone ideas, for instance, make sure to just sign up and, and register your talk.